Share a screen. All right. Here we are. We've got a uh, screen up there for you to see. Yep. Hopefully. All right. So this is uh, second part of the first section in chemistry, uh, matter part B. Um, just to refresh our memories as to why we need to know this stuff here, you need a basic understanding of atomic structure in order to understand the operation of analyzers and to understand the chemical processes that occur, that occur in industrial plants. Uh, this ILM completes a basic study of matter, the periodic table, and some material properties. Uh, it also contains some nuclear reactions and equations associated with those and a little bit on radioactivity. This is about 40 slides, uh, so it's not too bad today. No crazy math, so that's nice. Uh, so here we have the periodic table of elements, as we see here. Uh, just some general stuff about the periodic table. As you can see, it's kind of divided up into... Uh, little categories as you see across the top here. Uh, seven periods going this way and 18 vertical columns uh, going this way. Uh, this is not the greatest example to show you that there's 18 columns, but if you were to count all of these columns that are in here and all of these col columns are 18 and then there's seven horizontal rows on the periodic table, which are called the periods. Within the periodic table, we also have some groups of uh, elements that have similar uh, characteristics or properties. Um, we break them out into uh, different little categories for our course here. So some of them that we're looking at here, alkali metals, alkali earth metals, these transitions in the middle, uh, halogens and noble gases far over here on the right hand side. And the bottom, uh, we got a couple of identified here as the lanthanide and actinide series. And the thing about all of these things is that they have similar uh, chemical and reactive properties so in terms of uh, reactivity and, and the, the way they uh, get down to business with other chemicals is they're, they're similar to each other. Periodic table is generally uh, more reactive elements on the left-hand side, uh, left, less reactive elements on the right-hand side. Uh, you can kind of discern that by looking at the noble gases and the, and the halogens. Uh, you'll see some things in there like nitrogen and stuff like that, uh, which we uh, kind of identify as kind of being inert, and that's why we use them for calibration and stuff like that. So that's kind of a clue as to the less reactive on the right and more reactive on the left-hand side here. Every one of these uh, rows and columns, of course, has all kinds of different elements in it. And they're the elements that you see in the periodic table will look something like this. Uh, they'll have a symbol for the element. They'll have an atomic number uh, for the element that's related to the uh, number of protons. And then they'll have the weighted average atomic mass, which we learned earlier was uh, the mass contributed by uh, protons and neutrons and a teeny little bit uh, from the electrons. So some of the groups of the periodic table are either an A group or a B group. Um, as I said, looking at the previous slide there, we saw some of the A groups, those being the two on the farthest left and the, and the ones on the farthest uh, right um, as A groups or B groups. And they have special, special names, again, because uh, the elements within those groups are, are similar to each other. Uh, other groups that we're going to discuss are metals and non-metals, which are two really broad classifications that we'll look at. Uh, the stuff in between here, the B groups, as you can see, this is an A, this is an A. Uh, these are mostly all A's on the outside, and then all the B's are kind of wrapped up in the, in the middle section here. Uh, then there's some semi-metals or metalloids and some rare earths, and when they become relevant, we will uh, talk about some of these things. Okay, alkali metals, uh, group 1A, farthest on the left-hand side of the periodic table, and just a few points about, uh, about alkali metals, and we'll do this with a couple of the other groups as well. Um, you're not going to be an expert on the entire uh, periodic table, um, but you, uh, you'll have some basic information on some of the more important uh, sections of the periodic table. So the alkali metals in group 1A, they are the most reactive. They react violently with water to produce hydrogen gas. 
Uh, they are physically soft, low density materials with low melting points. A uh, common example of this is uh, sodium. Uh, if you've got nothing more exciting to do and you want to see how reactive sodium is, uh, go on YouTube or the internet machine there and, and search up sodium in water and you'll see all kinds of interesting uh, little experiments with people throwing uh, chunks of pure sodium into ponds and lakes and swimming pools and you'll see that uh, it actually reacts with water uh, violently creating uh, fire and it's pretty spectacular. Alkali earth metals uh, right next to the alkaline metals here. Uh, similarly, again, because they're on the left hand side, they're quite reactive. They also react with water to form hydrogen gas. They're harder uh, and denser than the alkali metals. And if you were to uh, compare some of these elements, maybe that you're familiar with magnesium and calcium, for example, uh, these are typically the things that uh, coat our plumbing. Uh, you know, if you have hard water or whatever, uh, these these type of deposits on your on your piping are quite hard, so it's kind of an easier way to remember uh, remember that characteristic. Uh, common examples here again: calcium, magnesium, as as I indicated a second ago, that you find in piping. Moving off to the far right hand side of the periodic table, we have the halogens in Group Seven A. Uh, they are all non metals, uh, and the halogens may be a solid, liquid, or gas, depending on which one. And depending on your periodic table, uh, some of them will um, present the uh, element names, either as a solid color or an outline color or a see-through color uh, to kind of indicate whether it's a solid, liquid, or gas. But that depends on the periodic table that you have. Uh, the fancier ones will do that for you. Uh, the ones that we use in this course are relatively basic, so probably not something that you really have to uh, worry yourself about too much. Uh, unique to the halogens in Group 7A is the fact that they are diatomic, uh, meaning that they are made out of two atoms, uh, two of the same atoms put together. So uh, Cl2, for example, is chlorine. Uh, so two chlorine atoms put together. Uh, Br2 uh, would be two bromines put together. Uh, oxygen, O2, uh, has two oxygens put together. So those are all, by, by definition, diatomic, meaning, meaning two, uh, two atoms. Uh, they are uh, fairly reactive actually over there and I know I said that they're less reactive and they are less reactive than the stuff on the left hand side but uh, in terms of things on the right hand side they're, they're relatively reactive. Uh, they will form ionic compounds with metals so we'll talk about that later um, how we take something from the left hand side of the periodic table and something from the right hand periodic uh, right side of the periodic table and we, we combine them and that's by and large uh, ionic uh, bonding and we'll talk about that in some detail later on. So here's an example of sodium uh, from way over there in group 1a with uh, chlorine which is a halogen in group 7a combining together. Uh, this is a solid, this is a gas, you have a reaction and they form table salt. So uh, interesting characteristics that you can get with the different combinations uh, of elements in the periodic table. Noble gases, uh, group uh, 8A, uh, including helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon, and radon. Uh, basically, these are non-reactive or what we call inert. Uh, therefore, we common, commonly use uh, some of these as zero gases when calibrating, such as uh, argon or uh, helium. Uh, they're often used as welding gases as well. So uh, it's that inert kind of non-reactive quality that we, uh, we like these things for. Okay, metals and non-metals. This is very important, uh, making sure that you understand the difference between metals and non-metals when we're looking at the periodic table. Uh, and it's quite simple. Uh, when we look at the periodic table, there is a step shape on the right-hand side that distinguishes the division between the two classifications, those classifications being metals and non-metals. So you see metals over here on the left-hand side, and we have the right, on, in the right-hand side here, we have what we call non-metals. And then we have this step. So if you're looking at your periodic table, this would be identified on your periodic table or most periodic tables anyway. Uh, and anything on the right-hand side of this step is a non-metal and anything on the left-hand side of the step is a metal. So that's pretty straightforward there, I think. Um, metalloids uh, are some of the elements that are just on each side of this uh, step, um, but you don't really need to know any of them. You just need to know where they uh, where they reside and basically they are along the step. 
So really, we're just kind of running through general uh, general uh, areas and properties of the periodic table. Okay, uh, metals versus non-metals. When we look at the physical and chemical characteristics uh, characteristics of metals uh, versus non-metals, pretty logical thinking uh, here. When we when we think about a metal, we we imagine certain uh, certain qualities about metals, and, and if you keep that in your head, you'll probably be right. Uh, and the non-metals are basically uh, those characteristics that are, are not metals, right? So uh, metals, we know if we uh, think about them, they're generally shiny, generally good conductors of heat and electricity, uh, generally solid at room temperature, uh, min you know, minus a couple of them. Uh, they're malleable and ductile, meaning you can work them a little bit, they're, they're shapeable. Non-metals, on the other hand, uh, Kind of the inverse, really. They're they're dull in appearance. They're poor conductors. Uh, they may be a solid, liquid, or a gas. They are generally non-ductile and brittle. So you'll have to just be able to identify a couple of characteristics that are associated with those two sides uh, of the periodic table. So that's kind of the periodic table uh, in real quick, general uh, general terms. We'll become a lot more familiar with it as we as we work through this course. Um, by the end, I'm sure there will be a, a half a dozen or 10 or 12 elements that you'll know uh, the names, the atomic numbers, and the masses all, all off by heart, but that'll take us a little bit of time. So uh, that's the general idea of the periodic table anyway to start out with. Uh, now we're going to start delving a little bit into the electronic structure. Uh, and this takes us back to looking at the, uh, the atom and the electrons and the protons and the neutrons on that kind of, and those kind of things. So if you've had high school chemistry, uh, some of this will be familiar to you. Uh, when we mentioned the Bohr model, uh, you might remember it as a, a bunch of circles. You put the symbol in the middle, and then there's a couple of electrons on one level, and then more electrons on the next level. So uh, the next little section here is going to be talking about the electronic structure uh, and the relationship between some of the things we see on the periodic table and the atomic structure. And the idea behind it is it leads us up to um, how do we get chemical reactions happening uh, and what are the pieces of different elements that are uh, involved in, in forming new uh, forming new things. So we're going to start out looking at the Bohr model, which is the model that you probably used in high school or the model that I used in high school. Uh, and then we're going to talk about a, a recent, uh, I don't know how recent it is, but it's in this course and I didn't take it in school. So I'm going to call it recent uh, advancement on the Bohr model. Uh, talking more about these electrons. Okay, so when we look at the periodic table uh, and this little diagram here, and, and uh, it, it kind of explains to us how many valence electrons, and we'll define valence electrons uh, later, but basically a valence electron is the number of electrons on, that are on the outer, uh, outer ring of, of an electron model, and we'll show you a model, I guess, before I start talking about it. But a uh, handy tip is if we work across the, the rows in the periodic table, the top row um, has a limit on the number of electrons that, a, that a, it can contain. So for example, uh, you got hydrogen and helium. There's only uh, atomic numbers of one and two, meaning that they've got one and two protons uh, each, which means they also have one and two electrons each. So the first row only holds uh, two electrons. We go down a row and we have elements that go from three to 10. Um, that second level can hold uh, up to eight electrons. So if we include the first, uh, the first row with two electrons and the second row that can hold eight, uh, that makes 10. And that's how we can get all of these different elements in there identified by these numbers. But we'll elaborate on that in the next couple of slides a little bit better. Okay, so here's this Bohr model you may remember. Uh, this is showing an element from period one and an element from period two. And basically, as you work down the periods in the periodic table, those, those horizontal rows, we're basically adding an extra ring on the outside. So you see period one has one ring, period two has two rings, period three will have three rings, so on and so forth. Uh, we don't get much farther than the, than the second ring, uh, sometimes delving into the third ring, um, but that's not... Uh, that's about it for us. So again, refresh, refreshing your memory on the Bohr model. Uh, the first uh, level or first ring can hold up to two electrons. The second ring can hold up to eight electrons. 
Uh, the third ring, if there was one, could hold up to 18 electrons. Uh, these are just things that you need to know. These are these are the facts. Uh, and by distributing uh, the electrons in here, we can uh, we can determine a bunch of different things. Uh, that is uh, how reactive it would be and what type of uh, an element it would be. So if I looked at this, for example, that had three protons, uh, I know an element that has three protons is going to be a specific element on the periodic table and it'd be that element with the number three. Go ahead. Just for the third level, is it eight or 18 that it holds? You know what? Uh, it says 18 in the ILM, but for some reason, my memory says eight. Uh, right, that makes sense for the table, yeah. Okay, just wanted to clarify. Yeah, yeah, I'm pretty sure the ILM says 18, but I'm pretty sure that's a mistake. I put it in here as that the we don't really go there anyway, so it doesn't really matter. Good enough. Yeah. Okay, so the whole idea behind this Bohr model is it it, it presents itself with the protons in the middle and then these electrons kind of or, orbiting around in circles around the outside of the electron. Well, science has changed. Uh, now it's not as cut and dry as, as that anymore. Uh, so we'll talk about how that develops. But long story short, when you look at this, you can tell a bunch of things. The first is the number of protons, which is directly associated to the uh, atomic number, which will tell us what the element is. So for example, 10 protons, if I looked at my periodic table for the number 10, I would say, I would see that it's neon. So I can identify this as neon. Um, it also tells me that I have uh, eight electrons in the outermost energy level. And we'll talk about the significance of these electrons in the outermost uh, level as we work our way through the course. So these electrons uh, uh, can move back and forth. It's, uh, they don't in the Bohr model, but the next page we're gonna talk about is something called the quantum model. And the quantum model kind of is evolutionary of this Bohr model. And, it, and it basically the difference between the two is, uh, the Bohr model says that these electrons kind of stay in these little levels and kind of go around and around like this, where modern science has discovered that these electrons actually uh, they kind of move back and forth between levels and in different places and they move around a little bit. It's not so cut and dry. Uh, and um, they did this by uh, bombarding uh, electrons with different kinds of light and then they gave off, uh, they gave off different types of uh, energy. They moved back and forth. And that was really how they discovered spectroscopic analysis, which is one of the analyzer technologies that you'll talk about next year. Uh, where we add light energy to electrons and we watch, watch them move back and forth. So that's a, kind of a sidebar. <clears throat> okay, the quantum model is this evolutionary step. Bohr's model was quite simple, uh, a little bit too, too simple. So now we use what's called the quantum model. And this puts the electron in orbitals uh, rather than levels. So um, one of the things that I uh, associate with levels is the more levels we have, the more energy we have. It's just a matter of we have more protons uh, and more electrons. If we have more levels, that's because we need them to house all these electrons. Uh, and if we have more electrons, they're associated with protons. And if we have more protons and more electrons, we just have more ener energy in, in general. Uh, and this leads us down a little bit of a wrangly, wriggly road that I don't really think makes a big difference in our lives as uh, instrument technicians. But again, uh, the idea here is to understand uh, how these things ultimately react in, in processes uh, that we work on. Okay, so first level, uh, less energy, second level, more energy, higher higher energy levels and their sublevels, you get more and more energy. So uh, let's move on here to orbitals. This is where you're probably gonna start getting brain cramps. Um, the new model of orbitals kind of makes a, a molecule look something like this. And it says, we've got, a, we've got an S orbital in the center here. And then we have uh, p orbitals that are on different axes uh, around uh, around the center nucleus here. Uh, then we'll have d's also, and there's also f's. We don't deal with the uh, d's and the f's. Um, again, uh, you start out at the beginning of the periodic table with you know things with a few electrons. Then when you have more than two, you got to add the p level into it until you fill up that second level. So that gets you all the way up to number 10 in the atomic, uh, on the atomic scale or the periodic table. And then elements that are number 10 and higher start using some of these things, but we don't do it. So don't worry about it, don't bust your brain. The ones we're, uh, the ones we're concerned with are these S orbitals and these P orbitals. And basically the, the science behind this 
uh, and the relationship to the Bohr model is this. The s orbital can hold two electrons, just like the first level in a Bohr model can hold two electrons. The p orbitals each will hold two electrons, so this is two electrons, two electrons, two electrons, um, and then they'll overlap with this one. So we get the two from here, and then we'll get the uh, the other six from from here, and then suddenly we're we're up to eight. So it's a way of us uh, identifying where the electrons are in terms of uh, the levels uh, in the periodic table. And this is long and drawn out and confusing. Uh, I, I apologize, but once we get going on what we're actually aiming for here, you'll see it's relatively simple. Um, I've added or I've left some of these slides in from my old presentation just because uh, there's only a couple pages in this current ILM that talks about these orbitals. And it's really just a flash in the pan that leads you to ask questions. Um, try not to ask too many because if it's not in the ILM, it's above your pay grade. So keep that in mind. Okay, next. So here's the P orbital. Uh, we've talked about the S orbital just being that one bubble. The P orbitals come in, in sets of three arranged along the uh, X, Y, X, Y, and Z axis here of a, of a 3D coordinate system. Each P orbital can hold a maximum of two electrons, so a set can take six. I know this is painful, just hang on. Okay, so electron there, electron there, 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 there. Wonderful. Okay, and then if you wanted to, we could add Ds, and Ds start looking like this. And this is just for interest. Uh, the long drawn out story about this is if we have the S in the middle and then we have the P's and then we have the D's, we're basically just making a model that allows us to account for all the electrons in an element. Uh, and there's far more to it, but um, this is enough for our interest anyway. So what does this tie into uh, in our course? Well, it leads us basically to something called electron configuration, which is a method of identifying elements by the, the structure of uh, the electrons in these different orbitals. So ultimately what we're going to do is, is be able to apply uh, a certain code using this 1s, 2s, 2p, 3p, all these little things here in order to identify elements, okay? So each orbital uh, can hold two electrons, the s has two, each of the P's, X, Y, and Z, also holds two. And the first level, again, uh, of the periodic table only has two electrons in it. The second level will introduce a potential for another eight. The third level will introduce potential for, I believe it's another eight property technically. Uh, and then I think here is where we start getting into the 18s. But most of our work is gonna be done in the first three levels. So don't panic yet. So here's where all this painful quantum nonsense is leading us is into something called electron configuration. So um, from the previous diagram, it shows us how to read the energy level progression. Uh, they increase from left to right, top to bottom. That's what this arrow represents here. So left to right, top to bottom. Um, and we'll show you how we work through this. Okay, um, for our purposes, the progression works like this. And you can see this on the, I'll flip back in a second and I'll show you on the periodic table, but it's 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, 4s, 4p. This is, um, whoops, this is the golden code, okay? So if all else fails, you just remember this, and, and I'll show you what the last five pages and 10 minutes were trying to achieve, and it's really quite simple, um, but it's based on this format. Um, we need to know this so we can do electron configuration. And if we we're going to write an electron configuration, for example, for hydrogen, we know that hydrogen has an atomic number of one, which means it has one proton, which means it thusly has one electron. So when we're distributing that electron, it's going to sit in the first level or the 1s level, and we're going to write it as 1s1. So if I was to show you this, 1s1, it tells you a couple of things. It tells you that you're in the first level of the periodic table. And it also tells you that you only have one electron. So if I look for an element that was in the first row of the periodic table and had one electron, I would find hydrogen. I know, kind of painful, um, but this is the this is what we're trying to achieve here. Neon, on the other hand, if you looked at your periodic table, it has an atomic number of 10, 
which represents 10 protons, which in turn represents 10 electrons. And if we were to distribute those electrons using this format, it's going to look like this. The first level is an S level. S's can only hold two. So there's the two. The second level, and I'll flip back here real quick. You'll see the second level, the second row. So the first row has one S, one S. That's all it's got. Uh-oh, excuse Excuse me. The second level you see has two S and two P, right? Third level has three S, three P. Fourth level has four S. It gets a little com confusing here, don't worry. Uh, four S and four P. So this is what we're doing, okay? So we're accounting for the 10 electrons. So we put them in the levels until we run out, basically, is the way it works. So the first level is only an S level. It can only hold two, so we put the two in there. The second level has an S level that can hold two, so we put the two in there. It also has a P, which will hold six, so we'll put six in there. You'll see now that I've got two, plus two is four, plus six is 10. That accommodates all 10 electrons for neon. So this is the electron configuration script for neon. This is the purpose of the last five pages, is to be able to take a name or a number or a configuration and give me the missing link. Okay, so a lot of the stuff we got, uh, we, we've read, read up until here is probably confusing, but the, the activity itself is relatively straightforward. So let's look at some other examples here. So hydrogen, we already did one, uh, one, one is the atomic number, one proton, one electron. So therefore it's one S one uh, represents one electron first level. Helium has an atomic number of two. So it's got two protons, also two electrons. So we write it 1s2 because we can put all the electrons in the first level, right? It's got enough space. Lithium, on the other hand, has three uh, protons. So there it has three electrons. So they're not all going to fit in the first level because we can only fit two. So we have to go to the second level with some of it. So we fill up the first level with the two and then distribute the remaining in the next available area, which is the 2s area. And we add that third one. So this two plus this one represents three electrons, which counter out the three protons, which identify it in the atomic number here as lithium. So let's skip down to something uh, a little crazier. You see, we don't get much farther than 10. Uh, let's look at oxygen. Um, Oxygen's atomic number is eight. That means it has eight protons, which means it also has eight electrons. So if we were to distribute them using our format, we put two of them in the first S level, we put two of them in the second S level, and then we put the remaining ones in the second level P section. So uh, eight electrons, so two, four, and four is eight. So this is the electron configuration for oxygen. So I could give you any one of these and ask you for the others, and you should be able to identify that. One of the other interesting things about this is this will also tell you how many electrons are on the outer level. So if we reflect back on the Bohr model, um, the inner energy level and then the outer energy level, the amount of electrons on the outer energy level are identified uh, by the numbers and, uh, or sorry, the subscripts and the numbers represented here. So this is the first level, the ones, Second level includes all the twos, the S's and the P's. So on the outer level of this particular atom, I have three electrons. On the outer level of this particular atom, I have four electrons. On the outer level of this particular atom, I have eight electrons. And it's the, um, the amount of filling of the outer level that makes uh, an element reactive or non-reactive. A happy element has its outer level full and it's content being all by itself. If it doesn't have a full outer level, it is going to either try to get rid of those electrons by giving them to some other element, or it's going to try to attract some electrons from some other element. And it is that characteristic that makes them reactive. Okay, it's a little bit, uh, a lot of theoretical information in one day, but that's where we're building up to anyway. All right, so here's a Another example, I don't know if we need to do one, but uh, if 
any of that stuff that we just talked about was confusing as I kind of did it live, this is kind of a step-by-step -step, step walkthrough. Is that a question? No question? Okay. So you'll get a question that says something like, what is the electron configuration for sodium? So we have to uh, do a few things. First thing, we got to find the atomic number for sodium. So that'll um, mean you have to go to the electron, uh, sorry, to the periodic table and, and look up its atomic number, uh, which happens to be 11. Okay, remember, S's can hold two electrons. Uh, each P can hold two, but there are three of them. So the P section can hold six. So the first thing we have to do is get the number of electrons. So we do that by looking up the atomic number for the element in question. In this case, sodium has an atomic number of 11, which represents the number of protons. And in an uncharged atom, that means it has the same amount of electrons. So in this case, it's 11. Level one is only an S level, so it can only hold two. Level two has an S and a P. The S can hold two and the P can hold six. Level three, can also do the same thing as level two because it's got an S component and a P component. So that level can also hold eight. So let's start at level one and pass until they're gone. Then we just record where they went. So hopefully it's pretty straightforward. First level is an S, it can only hold two, bang, two. Second level has an S that can hold two, bang, two. It also has a P, which can hold six. So we'll put the six in there. That is two, four, 10. We have 11. That means we need to go down to the next level filling up the S first uh, with the remaining one electron. We have now used all 11 electrons and this is now the representative electron configuration for sodium. Okay, so basically you just follow this format until you run out of electrons. So we'll go 1S, 2S, 2P, 3S, 3P, 4S, 4P, uh, and that's as far as we go in our course. Okay, uh, that leads us uh, into these valence electrons that I uh, precluded a second ago talking about these valence electrons being the ones on the highest energy level or the outer energy level in the atomic uh, model there. Uh, they have the highest energy and are farthest away from the nucleus. And uh, there's a couple of ways for us to find out how many valence electrons uh, there are. And the reason we need to know about valence electrons is again, uh, when we discuss reactivity, um, it tells us a lot about uh, how uh, an element, how conducive an element is to joining up with another one or not joining up with another one. Okay, so we can know, we can find out the valence electrons a few ways, and there's a couple of shortcuts here. Uh, first, from the electron configuration, you just add up the electrons on the highest energy level. So the number one here is the first level, the number two, is a, is the second level. Remember the S and the P are both on the second level. So that's, if we count the highest number here, which is two, we add up the electrons, which is eight. And this tells us that there's eight electrons on the, on the highest level. That's the hard way to do it. The easy way to do it, uh, the group number of the periodic table tells us the same thing. So for example, uh, if you have a periodic table in front of you and you look for chlorine, uh, you'll find chlorine, you go up to the group number, you'll see that it's in group seven, and lo and behold, uh, it's got seven valence electrons. If I asked you what element uh, this one here was, it's got two, four, ten, uh, ten electrons, what element is it? So that is a matching number of electrons to protons, and protons are the same as atomic number. So this would be neon, right? So if I found neon on the periodic table, uh, I can't remember where it is, but I can say that it's probably in group eight. And that's a handy little shortcut, right? Instead of having to add up this two and six to get eight and tell us that we're in group eight, um, we can just find the element in the periodic table, go up to where it identifies the, the group number and, and we know that way. So that's a handy little shortcut. Okay, Lewis dot diagrams uh, are, Go ahead. On that previous slide, why is it that we don't add all three of the electrons, like the the one, one, uh, yeah, those? So we're just trying to find out the valence electrons, and those are the ones that are on the outer levels. So we only count the ones that are in the highest 
level, right? Oh, I see. All right, so this is level one. This is like the first ring of the Bohr model, which can only hold two electrons. Yeah. This represents the second ring of the Bohr model. I don't know why the Bohr model works fine for our purposes, but they threw this in here just to make our lives miserable. But anything with the two, whether it's an S or a P, is that level, right? So this is the second level. We have to count all the electrons on the second level, which is the outermost level of this particular atom. And that's why we, we only count the ones on that level because we're worried about the valence electrons, which by definition are those ones on the outer or the highest energy level. Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay. No problem. Okay, so here's a much easier way to, to look at these valence electrons. Um, Lewis dot diagrams. So they're a convenient way to diagram what goes on when compounds are formed. So this is a Lewis dot di diagram uh, is a drawing that only shows the electrons that are on the outer level, right? So I don't have a periodic table and I don't know how I'm teaching without one, but uh, for example, if I looked up the atomic number for lithium, anyone got a periodic table in front of them? No. Atomic number for lithium is three, right? The atomic number for lithium is three, which means it has three protons, which means it also has three electrons. If I put two electrons on the first level, which I can, that leaves me with one. And here it is. This drawing represents only the outer level of that particular element, okay? So for elements, the diagram consists of the element symbol surrounded by dots or circles or X's or check marks, depending on uh, your instructor or who's, whoever's teaching you, uh, to represent the valence electrons of the atoms involved. The strategy with valence electrons is to place the dots one at a time around the symbol until there is a dot for each valence electron. If there are four or less, all the dots will be placed separately. If you have five to eight electrons, they'll be paired up, and that's illustrated here. If I only have one valence electron, it's just going to be here by itself. If I've got two, you know, distribute them. You, can you put them side by side? Yeah, you can. But, you know, it looks nicer this way. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And basically, the rule of, the rule of thumb is you start at 12 o'clock and start passing out electrons until you run out. So put this one, then this one, then this one, then this one, and then if you got another one, then it goes next to the first one, and, and so on and so forth, until you uh, account for all of your uh, electrons. So the significance now between these single guys over here, the single guy, these single guys, all of these single guys, these single guys, and these paired ones that we see over here, this is how we get new things. Okay, single dots represent bonding valence electrons, which are electrons that seek to pair up with another. Pairs of dots represent lone pairs. So these are the terms that are associated. So this is a bonding electron. This is a lone pair. Lone pairs are happy. They've hooked up. They're living a happy life together. They're not looking for any side action. Uh, they want to be just together forever. All of these ones over here, they're all single. They're looking for love. So if they had their way, they would find uh, another bonding electron and they would they would join up so that they're they're paired. And this is what we're building up to in chemical reactions because it's the absence or presence of these bonding electrons or lone pairs, again, that allow the different elements to combine and make compounds and stuff like that. That scared the shizzle out of me. Was that loud? Was that loud on your guys' end too? Yeah, that was really loud. That scared the poop out of me. <clears throat> All right, here, uh, moving again quickly into something uh, new, entirely nuclear reactions and radioactivity. Uh, we've talked about nuclear. Have we talked about nuclear a little bit? Another subject I seem to feel like I have already. Uh, at any rate, we talk about nuclear in measurement, we talk about nuclear in chemistry, and um, do we talk about nuclear somewhere else? I can't remember. At any rate, nuclear uh, comes into our uh, course here quite a bit. 
So we're going to talk really quick about nuclear uh, reactions and radioactivity in the next few slides here. Uh, again, this is kind of next level information um, designed to give us the background, uh, ultimately ending in some relatively simple uh, exercises. So let's see what this looks like for us. Okay, nuclear reactions and radioactivity. And we need to know this because again, we use nuclear uh, nuclear sources for some forms of measurement, uh, some level measurement, some density measurement, some moisture measurement uh, re re requires nuclear uh, devices. Uh, and this is why we're uh, kind of introducing it here. So uh, understanding how this nuclear stuff works a little bit uh, will help you in your job. Okay, so a nuclear reaction by definition changes the composition of an atom's nucleus. Okay, a chemical reaction does not remember chemical reactions. Um, the thing stays uh, the same, it doesn't matter anyway. Uh, nuclear reaction changes the atom's nucleus. That's where it gets most of its energy from. Two types of nuclear reactions that uh, we need to know about are called fusion and fission. Uh, quite simply, fusion is like the name would lead you to believe. Uh, we fuse. Uh, fuse two pieces of metal together when we're welding. Uh, in nuclear fusion, uh, fu fusion, we're fusing two different atoms together uh, into something else, which in turn gives off uh, energy. Fission, on the other hand, is the opposite of fusion, where we bombard a particular uh, radioactive particle with some energy, and it explodes into uh, smaller uh, pieces. So one is a joining and one is a disassembly. We'll talk about that more later. Okay, nuclear equations are the equations that are used to represent uh, the changes that occur in nuclear reactions. Isotopes, as we learned earlier, are atoms that have the same atomic number but different mass numbers due to different numbers uh, in uh, protons and neutrons. Uh, we've, we've covered this before already when we looked at carbon, the three different isotopes of carbon, uh, carbon-12, carbon-13, and carbon-14 all have uh, six protons, but they have different numbers of neutrons, six, seven, and eight, respectively. Uh, so this little isotope format symbol here is going to come into play uh, a little bit. Uh, very handy. Uh, make sure you know that the bottom number is the number of protons, the top number is the number of protons plus neutrons, and this number and this number are related to the name on the periodic table. Okay, so nuclear equations are something that we're going to be uh, dealing with at the end of this little section, uh, and basically they are uh, uh, the equations that represent the nuclear, uh, or the radioactive decay, or the reaction that occurs uh, in some type of a nuclear uh, equation. Okay, so radioactive decay is that energy that is uh, utilized in order to measure things. So radioactivity um, is important because this is what we use in our in our measuring devices. Uh, it is also, of course, very dangerous um, as radiation is given off in a nuclear, nuclear reaction uh, that occurs as a material reacts or emits radiation. <clears throat> This reaction is called radioactive or nuclear decay. So basically, as a radioactive element uh, decays or naturally reacts in the environment, we call that decay, it gives off energy. We harness that energy uh, to do work for us in terms of measurement. Um, we are going to identify three specific types of uh, radioactive decay. Uh, alpha, beta, and gamma, these are the same three types of radiation that we're going to look at when we talk about radiation in measurement. So a few things that you need to know. Uh, first of all is the name. Second of all is the formula representation for that type of radiation. And the third type of thing uh, is how dangerous is it to you? How much penetrating power does it have? And what format? Do the particles travel in. Uh, you'll see here alpha and beta particles travel in streams indicated by these arrows. They're basically just streams uh, of, of particles, whereas gamma radiation travels in a wave. Okay, so everything you need to know really is on this slide. 
the main the formula uh, is penetrating power it's fancy uh, atomic symbol or radiation symbol you'll see that there are different radiation symbols so this is alpha beta and gamma and then the way that the particles travel so a stream a stream and a wave uh, you can see alpha uh, you can block it with paper or light clothing uh, beta can be blocked with heavier clothing um, gamma radiation you need lead or concrete so this one here much more powerful much more dangerous and as you'll find out soon the one that we generally use for measurement purposes okay the rate at which these radioactive materials decay is defined by something called a half-life okay these isotopes decay at known rates regardless of temperature or pressure and the half-life of a radioactive element is the amount of time required to decay by half of its original amount so we'll look at an example here in the next slide here's the half-life calculation uh, we're going to drop some numbers on you when i was in school we had to remember these but i believe that all of the uh, radioactive materials and their half-lives will be given to you in any questions that you guys will experience so uh, for example here cesium-137 has a half-life 30 years how much of one gram will remain after 90 years pretty simple math at point zero I have one gram it has a half-life of 30 years so 30 years later I'm going to have a half a gram another 30 years later I'm going to have a quarter of a gram or half of what I had before another 30 years later I'm going to have half of what I had previously so after 90 years I'll have 0 0.125 grams of that particular radioactive material left so that is definitely something that you are going to see in terms of math. Uh, there's not a lot of math in this unit, but that is uh, one example of the type of math that you'll have to do. Uh, and again, uh, different elements. Um, cobalt uh, 60, for example, I think has a half-life of 5.3 years. So there will be different calculations based on uh, different specifications for that particular radioactive isotope. Okay, uh, next three slides are just general information on the individual types of radiations that we uh, highlighted in the first slide. So alpha first, uh, alpha radiation emits in a stream of helium nuclei. So here we have uh, uranium decaying, uh, giving off this helium four over two particle and a daughter nucleus. Don't worry about all this nonsense going on in here just know that alpha radiation is this type of particle right here two protons two uh, two protons and two neutrons as, you, as we see here as represented by the numbers two protons this is a combination of pro two protons and neutrons so four all together two of them are protons this is alpha that's what you need to know okay alpha again is a stream Beta is a stream, gamma is a wave, alpha is the weakest, beta is the next strongest, gamma is the strongest one that we look at. Here's a little crumb, I think that's what you guys call it, a crumb, I mean, leading up to something anyway, this is a radioactive equation, this is what we're building up to once we get through the basics of uh, uh, talking about alpha, beta, and gamma, is how to do one of these radioactive equation formulas, and they're really quite simple. Anything on the left-hand side of the arrow has to be balanced by anything on the right-hand side of the arrow. Uh, and I'm just going to quickly talk about this now um, because we're going to talk about it later. But you see on the left-hand side, I've got 238 over 92. That means on this side I hear, uh, over here, I also have to have uh, some balancing out to 238 over 92. So in order to do that, I got the 234 plus the 4, that makes 238, and I have the 90 plus the 2, which gives us 92. I'm not going to talk more about it yet, but hold that thought. Okay, next up, beta radiation. Again, beta is a stream of high-energy electrons, um, and beta particle looks like this. And this, as you see, is different than this, and that's going to make this math doable. Uh, 
in a, in a minute. Okay, so again, stream of high energy electrons gives off a beta particle. This is what a beta particle looks like. You are expected to remember this. Next, oh, I gave an extra thing for beta. Okay, so let's look at what this means again. Uh, 90 and 38 on this side, which means I have to have 90 and 38 on this side. If I didn't give you this, uh, let's not say that yet. Okay, let's look. 90 plus zero is 90. 39 plus a negative one is 38. So I have 90 and 38, 90 and 38. Notice it balances. So by plunking in a particular type of radioactive material, I can make balancing happen. So hold that thought on top of the other thought that you're already holding. Okay, gamma radiation has no mass or charge. It emits in a wave, uh, which it gives off when it's excited. And here we see that wonderful wave again. Uh, the symbol for uh, gamma is this uh, screwy looking Y with zero, zero. Again, when it comes to balancing, what's on the left must also be on the right. So 60 over 27. 60 over 27, this is a zero, this is a zero, so it balances, that's a symbol for gamma. So you need to know uh, alpha, beta, and, and gamma because this is leading up to something. Watch and see. Uh, other types of radiation, again, not sure the point, uh, not sure the point of this. I will tell you uh, that there is, a, there is what I call the 99% question. Uh, in an exam uh, on this particular slide here. Uh, I tell you to focus mostly on alpha, beta, and gamma, uh, but for the uh, particularly nerdy uh, students that I have, I, I might ask uh, another type of um, unstable isotope, uh, and that's included in the next couple of pages, but I'm not speaking individually. I don't think to uh, any one of these, but positron uh, has a different uh, electron can, uh, electron formula, just like the other ones did, same with neutron, uh, but I'm not putting a lot of weight on these ones. We're mainly focusing on alpha, beta, and gamma, um, but there is, I believe, one question that might come out of here somewhere in your future on a worksheet or a quiz or a test, I can't remember where. Okay, so positron emission, I'm, I'm showing you this just because, uh, for no reason, uh, Positron as a name would lead you to believe that there must be something positive uh, in, in it. And here it is. Uh, this looks similar to something we've seen uh, before, except it's got a positive value here. Uh, this is what a positron looks like. We're not going to get into the details. But again, looking at the chemical equation or their nuclear equation over here, left equals right, 22 over 11. 22 plus 0 is 22. 10 plus positive one is 11, so we have equal numbers on both sides, uh, and that balances. And again, I promise this is going somewhere. Okay, electron capture, yeah, here's another one uh, showing electron capture, don't really care. Uh, neutron gamma reactions again. Yeah, if you're keen and you want extra marks and you want to remember all of these, or, you know, whatever, it's, they're in there. Uh, this really just comes into these equations. Uh, it's more repeating than it is necessary in my humble opinion. Okay, so here's what this is all culminating in is a nuclear equation example. And this is very close to the end of the ILM. And here's what it's going to look like for you. And I think I pinched two examples uh, straight out of the ILM because I'm not going to make it any more complicated than the ILM is. Let's see, add the symbol for the emitted radiation to complete and balance the following nuclear equation. Well, you're probably thinking to yourself, I don't know how to do that. I just started this class. So what's the solution? Well, I can read the solution here and try to figure it out, or I can just go by what Tyler said, and whatever's on the left has to be on the right. So to do that, 18 on the left, 18 on the right, that means that my top number is going to be a zero for whatever this is. I have no idea what this is. I just started this course this morning, just like you. I have no idea what this is. Oops. Okay, so 18 here, there's already 18 here. So I know that this is going to be a zero on the top. I wish I had my pen working. It's 10 over here. 
and it's 11 over here. So in order to make the right side equal to 10, what do I have to put over here? Negative one, Tyler. Thank you for that answer. You're right. I have to put a negative one over here. So if I go through my list of different types of radiation and I look for the one that has a zero and a negative one, that will identify it as this, which happens to be beta. So that's what we're looking for. We're looking for zero over minus one E in this spot right here. And for you to be able to tell me that this is beta. So a lot of slides and a lot of information to kind of get you up to, to, to right there. Does that sound reasonably doable to you guys so far? Yeah. Sound is... Okay, good, thanks. I was gonna call you guys sleeping. Okay, so here's a twist uh, on that uh, same type of uh, same type of map. Again, just uh, interpolating it a little bit differently here. Determine the symbol and name for the unknown isotope a americium 243 produces when it emits an alpha particle according to the following nuclear equation. Again, it can be complicated or it can be easy. I teach the easy way. 243 on the left. I need to have 243 on the right. What do I have to do to get 243 over here? Well, I have to add 239 to this four. So I'm going to have 239 as my top number. And then I need 95 on the bottom. So I got 95 here. I've got two here. So the bottom number is going to be 93, right? So if I put 239, over 93, what's the name? Well, I go to my periodic table and I look up the number 93 because that represents the number of protons and it'll tell me the name of that element. And I don't have a periodic table, so I can't tell you. Um, here it is. It's Neptunium. Okay, so it's Neptunium. And it's going to have those two numbers that we just calculated, 239 over 93. 93 is the number for Neptunium. And that's it. That's the most challenging part of the entire ILM, I think, you know, aside from, uh, aside from being able to determine the valence electrons and electron configuration. Uh, I, I think I've done the brain cramping for you guys and, and gave you the easier way to do it. Um, hopefully you don't have any problems with that. If you do, again, just send me an email. Okay, uh, back to nuclear fission and fusion once again. So we touched on this in the beginning. Remember, fission uh, is, a, is a breaking apart or spreading. I told two friends, you told two friends, they told two friends. And fusion is the opposite where we bring two things together. Fission occurs when a nuclei is bombarded and it splits into two and then splits again, and then splits again, and then splits again. It generates lots of heat and other energy. It's good for us because we use this reaction for power plants. Don't think there isn't a question hiding in here somewhere. Um, it will become a chain reaction that will fizzle out when the base mass dwindles to an unusable amount. So it's just like, you know, probably the way we think of atomic energy. Uh, in the term of in the in the context of a Homer Simpson, for example, you drop the green rod of plutonium uh, into the reactor, and it starts reacting, giving off all kinds of heat and energy. And when it's done, you add another stick, and that's kind of the idea behind uh, fission. So there it is in a fancier fancier way. You don't need to know the dirty details here. You just need to know that fission looks like this and fusion looks like the other the opposite okay fusion occurs when two separate nuclei are heated to combine into one this requires a large amount of activation energy but the resulting energy that it produces is much much higher so again just differentiating between nuclear uh, fission and fusion that is it um, I hope you enjoyed that it is uh, a lot of material if you're new to it. If you had it in high school, it probably wasn't that bad. <laughs>